My name is Leroy Chow. I'm uh, with Epifan Systems. I'm the Vice President for Aerospace and Medical Applications. And what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about today is the Video Grabber and Modern AV Solutions. So before I joined Epifan, I had a, a career at NASA as an astronaut. And over my 15-year career, I had a good opportunity to fly four times into space. My first three missions were aboard space shuttles. And on my fourth mission, I trained with the Russians, I launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome and uh, out of uh, Kazakhstan flew on a Russian Soyuz rocket to the International Space Station where I served as the commander of the International Space Station during Expedition 10 on a six and a half month flight. Uh, over my career as an astronaut, I had uh, opportunities to do spacewalks, uh, six spacewalks actually, but, uh, three in, uh, <clears throat> four in American suits and two in Russian suits all in, in support of building the International Space Station. My technical degrees are actually in chemical engineering, so you might wonder what I'm doing here uh, working with a video company. Uh, I became very interested in life sciences and the effects on the human body uh, during my spaceflight experiences, especially during my spaceflight during, uh, on the uh, ISS. And specifically, the biomedical problems are the biggest technical issues we have, we have to solve before we can actually send people into longer missions and before we can talk about going to Mars and things like that. On board the ISS while I was there, uh, I had the opportunity to do a telemedicine experiment. And what we were doing, we were using an ultrasound machine, capturing the image using frame grabber technology, and then sending it back down to the ground in real time, where we could talk to the doctors on the ground, and we could act as their hands, and actually guide the probe, and we were able to image each other's internal organs, eyes, teeth, uh, and even, uh, as I said, in the first ocular exam in space, uh, which we, from which we wrote a paper and submitted from the space station. So with that, I came back and uh, get, got to be very good friends with the principal investigator of this uh, project, Dr. Scott Dolchowski on the left side here. He's the uh, chief of surgery at Henry Ford Hospital and also the principal investigator. And what he did was he found this company, Epifan, that made the frame grabber technology and the streaming recording capability in a very rugged, compact box. And we were able to actually use this on the ground through a United Nations program in, se in setting up telemedicine uh, expeditions on the ground in developing countries. So it's a real example of something de developed for space flight that is actually making life better for people here on the Earth. So I joined Epifan Systems just a few years ago to uh, help to generate more interest in aerospace and medical applications. Uh, the Epifan itself was founded in 2003, so about uh, 12 years ago. Corporate headquarters in Ottawa, Canada, although uh, a few years ago we opened a sales office in Palo Alto, California. We have over 20,000 customers uh, over, in over 100 countries, and in 2013, Epifan was named the third fastest growing computer peripheral company in the United States. So let's talk about frame grabbers. You all know the frame grabbers to get the image uh, from a camera or a video source into your computer. Uh, basically, what you have to do, you have a, a unit here, it's either internal or external, and it can grab either an image off of a screen or off of an AV input or off of a... Um, something, you know, a remote camera, and that will allow you, it'll, it'll do all the processing that needs to be done, and then allow it to be ported into a computer through a standard interface, and then allow it to be manipulated uh, by your specific application. So here are some typical uses in the corporate world, certainly not limited to these, but these are just some examples. Uh, media room sharing, so you can capture local room computers and cameras and then stream them to remote participants in you know, basically any part of the world. Uh, we can connect to other devices like people's iPads so that they can participate in the discussion during a meeting or a demonstration or making a point. You can do live events and conferences. You can record and stream things like all hands meetings or, or major announcements, again, to be streamed uh, remotely. Uh, you can combine the presenter camera and the, the slides, for example, to be streamed in a single stream. You can configure the, the uh, scaling to, uh, to make that uh, stream something that you want in the format that you want. Um, live product demonstrations and training. Uh, you can stream from a home studio to your customers to show off new products, prototypes, concepts, and do webinar type training. Product marketing and promotion videos, you can create these how-to videos, post them up on things like YouTube uh, to help your customers to figure out how to you know, operate your unit once they get it uh, delivered. Uh, social media, of course, we all know that uh, you know, these, are, these are ways to get content up into your social media to increase your visibility as well. So this is the functional pipeline of what happens inside a frame grabber. So the green box uh, represents the grabber itself, and the blue boxes inside would be the major functional functional blocks of the uh, the systems inside or the circuits inside. 
So of course your Visio source comes in on the left side, it needs to be uh, captured by a receiver, and if it's an analog signal, it needs to be digitized. It'll then go through a process of uh, scaling perhaps, or color format conversion and compression in order to create, take the raw video and make it manageable by your computer. So you're, you're either going to be limited by getting your video data into your computer, either by the computing power of the grabber itself or of the interface, right? Because the, the last step is to convert it into a, a standard bus interface uh, a protocol, and uh, that's, you know, depending on what your interface is, it may limit the speed. So you may have to do one or all of these things, scaling, uh, color format conversion and compression in order to get your package into a size that's manageable either by the interface or the, compute, the computing power of the, uh, uh, the grabber itself. Audio, uh, of course, most, in most applications, a lot of applications, you're going to want audio in addition to your video, and so you're going to have to capture your audio as well. Again, it's going to have to come into a receiver. If it's an analog signal, it'll need to be digitized. May need some resampling so that you can match the uh, match the bit depths and have it synchronized to your video. And of course, it also has to be adapted into the proper bus protocol, uh, along with the video stream, in order to be usable by your computer. So here's some properties of a, a video recorder. These are things to think about. Uh, it's not just a simple thing of saying, "Well, I need a frame grabber. I'm going to go buy a frame grabber, plug it in, and it's going to work." It really depends on your application. Uh, for you to optimize the settings to make sure you get the performance that you need for the application that you're going to use. So resolution, of course, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Do you really need full resolution or can you live with lower resolution and offload the processor uh, and your interface to allow you to get a steady, you know, uh, uninterrupted stream? Um, aspect ratios, of course, that needs to be considered during your capture. Maybe you have some custom resolutions or aspect ratios and timing. Interlacing and progressive uh, grabbing, can you, can you deal with uh, interlacing or is, is, uh, is your application sensitive to that? You're going to have to balance that against performance and capture rate, frames per second, right? So the higher the resolution generally, you're not going to be able to capture as high a frame rate unless you've got a lot of cap capability in your computing power and also in your interface. Uh, and it's going to change very based on your content. If your content is rel relatively static, you don't need a high frame rate, right? But if you're doing some high motion video, you're going to have to sample it at high frame rates, and you may have to trade that off with the resolution. Connectivity and form factor are important. Uh, are you going to use an external grabber or an internal grabber? And there are pluses and minuses to, to either. Uh, is it going to be self-powered? Is it going to be power over Ethernet or power over uh, USB? Uh, that's going to limit how much power you go, get to your processor, and that's going to limit how much computing power you have. Compression, uh, we like to not have to do compression, but if you have to, there are different schemes of doing compression. You have either lossless compression, what we call lossless compression, or lossy compression, and you know either or both might be okay depending on your application, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Color space, this is another way, the, the chroma subsampling, which I'll talk about in a few slides. Uh, what kind of what kind of in, uh, video are you bringing in? Is it RGB, true 24-bit color? Does it need to be converted to YUV so that you can do this chroma subsampling, which is another way of offloading your, your CPU? Playback's a consideration. What are you going to be outputting to, and what kind of formats are you going to need? So this, this diagram shows you... Uh, how you might be limited by your interface. So the interface is down here on the bottom. You have USB 2.0, which is still the most popular interface, probably going into a laptop today. Uh, and then PCIe on the right side. You can see that uh, depending on what you need, what kind of resolution and what kind of frame rate, uh, you could be limited by uh, what kind of interface you're going to use. So for example, if you want 1080p, full 1080p, uh, 1920 by 81080 at 60 frames per second, you're not going to get that through USB 3.0. You're going to have to go to a PCIe kind of a, a grabber an interface. However, if you can live with 1080i, which is at 30 frames per second, then USB 3.0, you can do that. However, if you're going to have a USB 2.0 interface, which as I mentioned is still the most popular <coughs> interface used today, you're going to have to do some kind of compression and or scaling and or uh, color matching. So scaling, let's talk about scaling. That makes sense when you're going to do, you know, you, you need to, as we mentioned before, you need to think about your output. Are you going to do a picture in picture? Are you going to do a side by side? Uh, you can see on the left side, these two frames, the uh, 
uh, the capture of the person and then of the data there at full resolution. And then the final product, the final video out is going to be at full resolution, but you can scale. If you're going to put them together, you scale them and make them smaller. And if you do that in the hardware, then you're going to offload uh, the, uh, uh, the amount of uh, computing power that you're going to need. So what you do is you make them smaller in the hardware before you send it to your computer. And what that does is it generates, so you still got full resolution on the right. But then uh, the images, you still got the same number of pixels, but the images are smaller, so one consequence, you might get a little bit of uh, distortion in uh, uh, fine text or fine lines, so that's something to consider uh, as well. Downscaling is typically better than upscaling, uh, but at any rate, uh, you may result in some kind of downstream scaling, upscaling in your application. Chroma subsampling is a neat way to offload your processing needs. Uh, what the idea is that uh, uh, the human eye actually is much more sensitive to changes in luminosity or brightness than in color. And so what we can do, sorry for being graceful, what we can do is send the signal, send the video at full luminosity so that your eye kind of sees that everything stays bright, but then send, have different schemes of sending different ratios of the color subsections perhaps you know, only one pixel out of four, and then you alternate which pixels get the color in the next frame. And that way you can greatly reduce the computing power needed, and this is a way to visually losslessly compress, or you know, kind, of a, uh, kind of a compression scheme, I guess, to, uh, you know, but basically all movies that you buy, any DVD or Blu-ray, uh, is gonna have chroma subsampling, and so what it does is your eye cannot, literally cannot tell the difference. It's not going to be the same as, you know, technically speaking, as what you're seeing in the movie theater, uh, but your eye cannot detect that difference because you maintain the luminosity. So it makes sense unless you absolutely have to maintain the integrity of the original video, the original color. For example, some kind of a forensic uh, evidence capture, some kind of a special metal, uh, medical application that you really need the true color to, to do your diagnoses. Uh, so it's not for everyone, but in general, this is a very good scheme for reducing the computing power required. Frame rate reduction, that's another way to, to offload your processor. Uh, if you've got a relatively static image, like a, a radar screen, uh, it doesn't change very often. And so you really don't need to sample at a high sample rate. You can actually take uh, slower frame rates, and that will greatly reduce your computing, computing power needs. Compression. Well, you know, nobody likes the word compression because, you know, they think you're going to lose, uh, you're going to lose something, and that's certainly the case in lossy compression, but there are loss-less compression schemes as well. If, if, if scaling and uh, chroma subsampling don't solve your problems, you're still limited by your, your bandwidth through your interface or your computing power on the grabber, uh, then you're going to have to do some compression. In lossless compression, what you do is that you you kind of do it in an intelligent way. You look at the background. If, only, if your background, if parts of your background are not changing, you don't need to sample those at every frame, right? You can keep them the same and only change the, uh, change the data that are in the parts that are moving. And that's one way to do what we call the lossless compression. If you have lossy compression, you're actually throwing things out, and so you're sampling less, uh, less pieces of the, uh, the entire vi uh, video, video uh, screen. And so in that way, you're actually throwing data away. Uh, another example are, are movies, again, DVDs or Blu-rays. They're compressed quite a bit, but your, the human eye can't really tell. But if you were to take that, you know, it looks fine on your laptop or even on your home TV, but if you were to take that same video and, and try to play it in a large theater, uh, you would see that there are data that are, that are missing. Power is a big consideration. I talked about power over internet or power over ethernet, power over USB earlier. Uh, that's the way that most of your, your external grabbers are going to work. Uh, you can have grabbers with external power sources, but that means that you've got, you know, it's not true as portable as you might like, or you might be tied to a power, uh, power plug somewhere. And so you look at the, uh, what's possible through power through USB and, U and power through Ethernet, you can see that you could be limited by power, and that, of, of course, directly correlates with uh, how much computing power you can have on your grabber, and therefore how capable your grabber would be of giving you the highest resolution, highest frame rate grabs. Internal capture cards are better, that you can pu pull more power through the bus, uh, but of course you've got to take into account the heat, you know, whether your box uh, uh, should be good enough to, to reject the heat, but you want to make sure that you've got good enough airflow in there, good enough cooling, so that you don't damage the equipment inside. 
So let's talk a little bit about software. Now that you've got your signal going into your computer, what are you going to do with it, or how do you get it to, to your application? So first you're going to need drivers. Uh, drivers are either going to be vendor-specific or they're going to be OS-specific drivers. That's going to allow, uh, allow the computer to understand what's coming in, the data that are coming in. Uh, driver functionality, some of the things that the driver is going to do, it's going to do the, uh, provide the uncompressed real-time video to the software application through the interface. It's going to do some decompression maybe, uh, maybe some uh, scaling, either upscaling or downscaling. Uh, it might need to do some more color conversion and, uh, and or cropping. And so then that goes up to the interface, the kind of the orange level. That's the real-time video transfer. So you're going to be going into something like Direct Show or, uh, or Media Foundation or QuickTime if you're using a Mac, um, you know, Linux applications or some kind of a proprietary system. And then that allows the information, the video information and the audio, if you've got that, to go up into your software application where you're going to actually be able to manipulate it and use it. So uh, now that the video image is available, the software application, any pop these popular software applications can then use it. A lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of modern, uh, inexpensive modern meeting applications work with this kind of thing. So WebEx or Skype or GoToMeeting. You can broadcast through, through a content delivery network. So there are two ways to use the video now that you've got it onto your, uh, your, app, onto your laptop. You can, do, um, you can do applications on the desktop and uh, using vendor viewing applications or third party application, you can view the video. You can share the desktop via, as we just mentioned, via something like a, a WebEx or a, a GoToMeeting. And it's the best choice for high resolution fine detail at a lower frame rate. Or you can use it as a camera. Basically, you can use that application and open it up, capture that video as a web camera, and it'll appear in the drop-down menu as a web camera, and then you use that uh, to share, to incorporate video into your application. And that's the best choice for cameras uh, where you need, you know, you've got some motion going on, you're not just looking at PowerPoint slides. So using video grabbers with uh, UCC clients like Skype, something like Skype or GoToMeeting, uh, basically, uh, you, you, it appears, as I mentioned, as a web camera. It's very simple. You connect the source, you connect the grabber to the computer, and then your, uh, uh, your source should, should appear in the uh, drop-down menu. You can select it as a web camera and then use that inside of the application. So this shows you how you can uh, just pull it down from there, get that using your grab video from the external camera or source as uh, part of GoToMeeting. You can also, of course, take that and stream it. A lot, of, a lot of people need to stream the video once they grab it and get it into their computer. And so in this example, you see two video sources being grabbed, the, uh, the camera, the SDI camera on top, and then the computer screen on the bottom being grabbed by two external grabbers being combined into a computer here for processing. Uh, you can use something like uh, Wirecast against some kind of content delivery network to go ahead and encode the the, uh, the captured content and then stream it out to your clients. So this is what that looks like. So why don't we just use software instead? Use something like WebEx to basically do what we call screen scraping. And that works well when you're looking at PowerPoint slides where you know, not much is changing very quickly. And basically what you're doing is you're taking a series of of consecutive screen grabs and then transmitting that over to uh, participants in other locations. And it's not practical for a lot of devices, like for example, smart boards and cameras, that obviously wouldn't work. Uh, it can, can be kind of unfriendly way to do things for your guests, and there can be software issues if you're not using the same version of software across your different participants. Uh, you could have some compatibility issues. Uh, the performance, as I mentioned, is lower, but it works fine if you're going to do it for something like PowerPoint slides. Uh, but again, with high resolution content and uh, with motion, uh, it's not going to perform very well. So by basically, video grabbers allow you a lot more flexibility than what we call the screen scraping. So in summary, uh, video grabbers are going to enable you to, in real time, capture video and audio for your software applications. Uh, it goes through standard OS interfaces, and you can interface with a variety of commercially available software. In some cases, your drivers, like the USB, they're going to be included. Otherwise, it's going to be vendor specific. Uh, scaling, color compression, cropping, all those schemes can be done in the hardware or the software. But if you know it's going to end up that way, it's easier to do it in the hardware to offload the computing needs later. 
a one size fits all solution is possible, but you still are going to have to go in and, and change some setting on resolution, capture rate frames, and all that to in order to optimize it for your particular application. And that's going to depend on what your needs are. If you're catching a lot of motion in your video, or if it's relatively static, you're going to adjust your resolution, frame rate, things, other settings like that, uh, appropriately to optimize your capture. And once you've selected and configured your grabber. Um, you know, using it within your applications is, is really an easy thing. And if you drop by our booth at Epifan, uh, down at home number nine, we can give you a demo and show you uh, in the couple of hours that are left in the show uh, what we're capable of. Either that or visit us on the internet, www.epifan.com, and uh, we'd be happy to help you out. So thank you again for coming to the last lecture on the last day. I appreciate your, your tenacity, and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you.